Here we are at Risdon Cove, the site of the first settlement for whitefellas uh, in, in Tasmania and also one of the sites of uh, one of the saddest moments in our history. It was uh, down the mountains you see behind me or down the hills you see behind me that the, the big river clan were herding kangaroos and uh, one of the farmers uh, or labourers uh, recalls the moment and is, wrote down his account and said none of them were carrying spears, they were all uh, herding the, the kangaroos for a, a feed it was, and uh, this is part of the Oyster Bay Nation area uh, and uh, the, the farmer reported it back to the soldiers and the soldiers were scared because there was about 300 or so uh, Aboriginal people herding the, the kangaroos down and uh, the soldiers went and uh, started shooting. Uh, they then lined up uh, what they call a cannonade, which was a, a small cannon designed for military uh, use uh, and, and naval use particularly, and they rammed it full of shot. So it, it was not just one cannonball, but they call it grape shot. They, they rammed it full of that and uh, scores of uh, the Aboriginal uh, Big River Nation uh, were killed uh, just behind me and uh, in many ways the very sad chapter of uh, our history began. Now what is uh, sad about that is that uh, Lieutenant Collins the, who was in charge of the, the uh, uh, outpost at that time had very, very clear instructions. Let, let me read you what instructions he had. He was to open uh, a discussion, or in Old English it says open an intercourse with the natives and to conciliate their goodwill in joining all persons under your government to live in amity and kindness with them and if any person shall exercise any acts of violence against them or shall wantonly give them any interruption in the exercise of their several occupations you are to cause such offender to be brought to punishment according to the degree of the offence. That were the instructions they came here to Risdon Cove with and uh, they weren't the instructions they lived by. As we come towards the end of the first chapter of James, we, we too have to face the fact that as followers of Jesus, we've been given a set of instructions that sometimes, if we're to be honest, we don't live by. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me again to James chapter 1. And James has just talked about the, the Word of God that's implanted in your heart. And now he says this. He says, Don't merely listen to the Word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I remember uh, as a young bloke, I, I'd been on a journey of faith. I, I got baptised in Broken Hill and I went and, and did Bible college uh, in uh, Sale in Victoria and came down on the Abel Tasman with a few friends and we were going to save Tasmania. I bet you're pleased to know that uh, I was going to save you for those of you who are living in Tasmania at the time. Uh, I had The Bible college for me had been transformative. I had learnt so much. But in all honesty, my head was full of ideas. I had all the right ideas for stuff. I, I lived in a quite a black and white world where, you know, I had all the right theology, but in many ways I didn't have a clue. There's a real danger of having a head full of ideas that aren't lived out in your life. And that's what James is saying here. He's saying, don't just get a head full of ideas. If it's not working itself out in your life, it's not working out at all. He's saying, if you, if you just hear God's word and don't do what it says, you're actually deceiving yourself. And, and if I'm, to be honest, as I look back, I think I was a bit deceived. I think I, I had all the right ideas, but in my world, things were neat and tidy and I kind of, I, I thought I understood all about God. I thought I understood all about Tasmania. I understood all about people. Uh, and I was deceived. I think 
I don't know if you've ever met anybody who is uh, full of all, full of a whole lot of ideas and doesn't have a clue. Well, there's a real danger. I, I, it's Alan Hirsch who said, many Christians are educated well beyond their level of obedience. And this is what James, who's writing to a bunch of people in, in a bit of a crisis, he's saying, make sure your education doesn't exceed your obedience. And he goes on and he says, anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror. Do you know that most Bible translators in that verse have actually left out a word, including the NIV, which I often refer to. They've left out the word Genesis because they don't know what to do with it. Before the word face is in the original Greek, the word Genesis. It's, it says, anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like someone who looks at his Genesis face in a mirror. What it's saying is, as you open yourself to the word of God, it's like you get to see who you are meant to be, who you were created to be from the very beginning. This is what the Word of God's for. It's to help us get our bearings in a confusing world, to understand the beautiful part of us created in the image of God, but to also, as we see that part of ourselves, to understand the part of us that isn't so pretty, to understand the truth and be able to separate the worthless from the precious, as the prophet Jeremiah talks about. And many of us, one of, one of the real dangers here is uh, you can have a bumper stick of faith that reduces your faith to a cliches and we don't actually get into the word of God deeply. There is this beautiful truth that James has previously told us that the God's word is planted in us. But he's saying that we need to look at ourselves in the mirror and use the word of God as a mirror and not just as a bunch of ideas. He goes on and says, someone who does that is like someone who goes away and immediately forgets what they look like. Like if you just treat the, treat the Bible as a set of ideas, it won't be a roadmap for your life. It won't help you navigate the complexity of the real world. James says, but whoever looks intently, looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. What he's saying is the recipe to be able to navigate this life is to put energy into the perfect law to put energy into the Word of God and let it be your roadmap. Let it, let it be your mirror. And it's interesting, he talks about the perfect law. What it's clear, he, he's, he's certainly talking about the Old Testament, but he's talking, the word there, perfect, means complete or fulfilled. And, it, and, and he's saying that the Word of God of, of the Old Testament has been completed and fulfilled in and through Jesus and through Pentecost, which we celebrate today on this Pentecost Sunday. And so on this Pentecost Sunday, we celebrate that there is a, a perfect law that brings freedom. Commentators ag again believe James is referring back to the book of Jeremiah and uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, where, and it seems as though this, this really did frame a lot of James's thinking, this promise in Jeremiah 31 where God says to his people, this is the covenant I'll make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and I'll write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the, know the Lord. What he's saying is no longer will they be focused on ideas and trying to remember ideas because they will know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Owen's gonna talk more about it, but through what Jesus did on the cross, through his resurrection, and then through the incredible moment of Pentecost, which we celebrate on this day, 
we are invited into the perfect law, the perfect way of life that's empowered by the Holy Spirit that, what, that gives freedom. Many of us would see the, the Bible as like a, a book of restrictions. And, and when you see the Bible that way, you're seeing it in exactly the wrong way. It's, it's, a, it's a, a roadmap for freedom. As Paul says in Galatians, a, a number of years after the book of James was written, he says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So James says that we are to be looking intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continuing in it, not forgetting what we've heard, but doing it. And they'll be blessed in everything they do. My prayer for us, and I think what this world cries out for, is not people like Collins who, who got some instructions and, and kind of obeyed it. We, we really don't want to be the kind of Christians that get some instructions and kind of obey them. Because you can see the damage that happens when, when there, are, there is a, a law that points a way to life and it is ignored. And for all of us, it's true, isn't it? That the times where you have gone against the Word of God, where you have been self-focused, where you have been greedy, where you, where you have stepped over boundaries, isn't it true? It hasn't brought you freedom. We're invited on this Pentecost Sunday to imagine a different kind of future, a future in which we are ministers of reconciliation through the power of of Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, his resurrection, and the incredible truth that we celebrate on this Pentecost Sunday of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which means we don't have to do life on our own. Isn't that good news? Owen's gonna be sharing more about this. And I, I am I'm grateful that together we can engage with the law, the perfect law that brings freedom.